Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. Today, we have a very special guest with us. Her name is Trina Chan. Trina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Maggie. I'm super excited to be here. We're very excited to have you on the podcast as well. So let's jump right into it, Trina. We'd love to know, you know, where you grew up, where you were born and raised, and what that experience was like for you during your childhood. So I was born and raised in Singapore, and I spent a few of my formative years in Hong Kong as well. My mom's Korean, my dad's Chinese, so my siblings and I were very lucky to be exposed to both cultures in our household. And growing up, I always gravitated towards anything creative, especially when it comes to art and design. And I think all credit for that goes to my mom, who really encouraged that growth by putting me in art classes, making sure I always had my paintbrushes and my coloring supplies at every stage of my childhood. And unlike my older sister, I was a painfully quiet and super reserved kid. And I found it very challenging to speak up but I discovered very early on that I could express myself through art in a way that I wasn't able to articulate in words. And I think having access to these tools made my inner world very rich. And that practice of actually painting or sketching, it's still something that I find very therapeutic and very comforting even till this day as a 30 year old. I find that I'm happiest when I'm in a position that I can create. So after high school in Singapore, I then went on to study at Parsons in New York. And throughout my time there, I secured these internships at headquarters, uh, places like Alexander Wang, Balenciaga, Christian Dior, and the LVMH building. And I was a sponge. I was so hungry to learn. I said yes to every single task that was handed to me even though sometimes I really had no idea what I was doing, but I just really wanted to be a valuable part of the team. And I think people really recognize that. And that allowed one door after another to open up for me, even though I had no connections in the industry. Um, So fast forward, I ended up in the Bay where I currently reside uh, after taking on a merchandising role at Sephora headquarters here uh, before going on to help build a company called Museum of Ice Cream and now launching number eight. Wow, what a journey. That is so amazing. And I love that you mentioned that when you were younger, you were very quiet. You didn't know how to express yourself. I feel like I really resonate with you in that way because I, when I was a kid, I was always really quiet too. Like my parents would always consider me as like the quiet sibling or the quiet child. I would never know how to like speak my emotions out or, you know, say what's on my mind. And it was very hard for me to express myself the same way that you described. And I'm, I'm glad that you were able to find a way to express yourself, to articulate yourself through arts, you know, being creative um, because a lot of people don't you know find that until like a, a very late age right and so it's right. amazing to see and know that you were able to you know know how to express yourself in that way right. um, as you were you know when you were a kid did you always know that you were going to be an entrepreneur or was it something that you kind of fell upon later on well I think even growing up I had very strong examples of women on entrepreneurship in my in my family. So my mom had her own cake store. And I remember going in as a kid with my sister and picking out cakes, thinking of ideas that we could build together, what type of, of design, uh, you know, how should the layout of the store look like? What should the packaging look like? And I feel like that was my first touch point and really understanding what that would entail. And separately, I would say also my grandma, my papa, she had a store, a clothing store in Hong Kong. And I think even watching her into rock with her customers and every single garment had a story, had a selling point. I think even seeing those examples, it's stuff that, you know, I, I look back on and I think, wow, I, I actually had that foundation. I had that exposure so early on. So absolutely very lucky in that sense. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's amazing to kind of go back in time and see like what those instances were where you could see, you know, my grandma was an entrepreneur, you know, like I I had these like, you know, instances where I could see my family working really hard, right? Because for for myself personally, like I didn't get to see that none of my family members were entrepreneurs. And so for me, it was like kind of a concept that was like hard for me to grasp, right? 
And I think it's really important to kind of go back in time and see like, what were those instances that like sets us up to really recognize like, oh, can I become an entrepreneur? Can I see myself to be in this field? Um, I remember you mentioning that you got into Museum of Ice Cream. What was that um, timeline like? Like, were you, did you start Museum of Ice Cream right after leaving Sephora? Um, and then what made you kind of leave Sephora to pursue um, that position at Museum of Ice Cream? So uh, my museum of ice cream was actually started by one of my good friends that I went to school with at Parsons. And she had come to me with this idea of, you know, Trina, I'm opening up this location in LA. We started off in New York and I just need support on the retail side. I need support thinking about partnerships. And so I started taking on these side projects as I was working at Sephora from my nine to five, I'd be at my desk job. And when I would go home, it would be everything museum of ice cream. So scouring products that we could build part partnerships even that we could land and helping her with that. And it just grew to a size where all of a sudden I had to commit full time. And, it, you know, I think that opportunity was pretty interesting. I remember talking to my parents about that at the time and they were like, what are you doing? Like, this is not even a proven concept and you're going to give up, you know, such a cushy job and, you know, uh, job security, not just that, but also healthcare and, you know, your 401k, you're going to compromise all of that. And in my gut, I just knew like, if there's a time to try anything, anything like this, it would be now. Um, you know, I don't have any other responsibilities aside from myself, my rent, which I knew I could cover. And I feel like I just wanted to take the leap and try. And I think the biggest thing too was, I was able to be creative for the first time I was able to create installations, I was able to create products that we sold in the store. And that to me was just so fulfilling and not just that, but also scaling the team. So going from a team of five to all of a sudden a team of 30, essentially overnight when we opened up our headquarters in New York, that was an experience in itself. And I think that was a firsthand seat into what it was like to actually build a company from the ground up. Amazing. I remember when Museum of Ice Cream just came out in San Francisco. That was when I was living in San Francisco. Yeah. And it was like this new concept that like no one heard of before. Like, and it just was so aesthetically pleasing that everyone was just like ready to jump in on it. Like, what is this Museum of oh. Ice Cream thing? And I kept seeing a lot of people like take Instagram photos of it, putting it on their Instagram stories. And I was like, oh my goodness, like people were just lining up. I remember lining yeah. up and the, the line was so long. Um I mean, the execution of it was just amazing and it got so popular so fast and I still see it, you know, going on today and just like, just wanted to commend you for like all the work that you've done for it because I'm, oh. I'm sure it must have been so crazy and, you know, very, very busy for you during that time. Can you kind of walk us through like what things you've learned during your time at Museum of Ice Cream that totally. kind of prepared you to propel into like full you know, being co-founder or found founding your own company? Like what were some of the, the things that you learned? Totally. So I, I think just even from a team perspective and how you lead the team, I think everyone was so young and it was all of our first time creating something new together and leading teams that I think it was all trial and error. So there are certain elements that I understood, okay, if I were to ever create something that was truly mine, I'd want it to lead it in a, a, dif a different way. I would maybe want to use a different tone. I'd want to be a little bit more stern in these areas. And I think just even learning what my leadership style was in comparison to all the rest of the founding members was crucial. And I think there's a lot of learnings that I applied right now. Um, but this is also where I really learned the power of brand identity and the importance of utilizing various means to reinforce it. So whether it's this, you know, the green box that our number eight glass jars come in or the printed brochure that explains our ingredients that come with it, um, or even the social identity of our social media content, everything that we put forth has to complement the sensibility of our brand. So I'll be the first person to mention like, hey, our font here is incorrect or the shade of green here is too dark or the, our logo seems to be stretched out too wide. And as a creative, you understand that those are the details that really matter because that's what it means to establish a full on cohesive brand identity. So I think those were the learnings that I think were most crucial to me, aside from, of course, understanding how to pitch a product, understanding how to sell yourself. I think we had mentioned as we spoke, 
we both identify as introverts. So Museum of Ice Cream was the first time I was actually pushed to go into a room and sell myself and introduce myself to people and network. And that to me was something that I find Sometimes I still find that very uncomfortable, but I got comfortable with the idea of just, all right, I'm going to sit through this discomfort because I just have to do what I got to do and get myself out there. So I'm very grateful for my time there. And I, I, I definitely learned not just a lot about myself, but how I want to be as a leader. Yeah, that's amazing. And I mean, let's talk about number eight for a little bit. Yes. Um, I, you know, there, if anyone has seen the bottles and the jars of number eight, like you can immediately tell that you put so much detail and attention into the design. Um, can you tell us like what number eight is and yeah. just, you know, how you came up with the name and how you came up with the design as well? Totally. So our company number eight, we specialize in naturally derived nootropics. Mm -hmm. And for anybody who's not familiar with that term, a nootropic is essentially a compound that improves your cognitive functions, like your memory and your concentration. And there's two different types. So there's natural nootropics, which are derived from plants. The most well-known one that we all probably use is coffee. And then there's more synthetic nootropics, which is something like Adderall. So it's lab created compounds. And at number eight, we only utilize naturally derived nootropics with proven efficacy in healthy adult humans. Now, the reason why I emphasize that is because I learned through the doctors on our wellness council that a large majority of supplements that are on the market utilize test tubes and lab mice for their product claims, the findings from that. And oftentimes that doesn't necessarily translate to a fully functioning adult human body. And not only that, a large number of manufacturers actually overdose or underdose their active ingredients. So for our team, it was very important that we're able to find the supporting literature, supporting data from double blind clinical trials in humans to support every single active ingredient right down to the exact dose. And that's what we share on our website. So the reason of but behind that is we want to be able to equip our customers with the information that they need in order to go to their physician, especially if they're on medication currently, and help them evaluate whether this is the right product for them. Um, we currently sell our gummies online, 8.health, and we've recently announced our exclusive partnership with the Four Seasons Hotel in New York, which is our first in real life touch point. Um, but from a branding perspective, you know, diving deep into just even how that came about, we began building this brand at the height of lockdown in March of 2020. And it started with multiple focus groups among our friends and uh, you know our family, and they got really candid on areas that they're struggling with. And I think our team was also just very open about the different areas that we needed extra support on. So that's how we're able to land on our core product line, which are sleep, uh, you know, gummies for jet lag. We have uh, energy, which is gummies for fatigue. We have focus, which is gummies for brain fog, and then we have calm, which are gummies for stress. And I think to kick off the design process, we asked all of our friends, hey, please send us the medicine cabinets. Like, where do you store and how do you store your supplements? And we received a lot of pictures of clear plastic bottles that were just like shoved away somewhere uh, that never saw any daylight. And it wasn't a highlight to anybody's day. And that to me presented a really, really big opportunity because we know that if you want to establish a really good habit, it has to be enjoyable. That experience has to be enjoyable. And this is where I'd also draw on my experience with Museum of Ice Cream and how we wanted to have people feel as they were interacting with a room, interacting with a product in their hand. I wanted it to be something that you would enjoy having on your kitchen counter or on your desk. So, you know, it's meant to serve as a vehicle for self-care, a reminder to really carve out these little moments in your day just for you. And from my perspective, you know, the halo effect of good branding is that it spurs conversation. It becomes this multiplier effect because if something catches your eye, it's probably going to spark some form of curiosity. And the glass jars are meant to encourage people to ask um, and to share about their wellness practice. And hopefully that also opens up the opportunity to tell others about brain health and about mental health as well. 
I love that so much. And I definitely agree with you. I think a lot of the, you know, supplements or gummies that we buy from like Costco or your, you know, bigger manufacturers, they do come in like plastic bottles where you're right. Like I just store them in my cabinets and I don't even, you know, want to look at them because it's not really like pleasing, aesthetically pleasing. And so oftentimes I even forget to eat them, right? Because I'm just like storing them in my cabinets. But honestly, like to the listeners out there, like, the branding and the design for the number eight bottles it's so beautiful like you can see and tell from the intricate details on the jar it's like amazing um I do have a question yes. uh, in terms of that you know there's I, I feel like this is kind of like a polarizing question because a lot of people say like when you first start a business you know like you should just do it just do it and you can think about the design the branding later on um because I feel like a lot of people get so stuck on that um and just yeah. get kind of overthink it a little bit right like they can't come up with a design that they really like but they tend to they will you know end up perfecting it later on but I feel like you have come from a background of you know a lot of branding experience um, you've had experience working in a bunch of designer brands and fashion brands so I feel like you've you know had that experience um, in your background and so what is your take on you know perfecting the design of your product or you know the packaging of your product rather than just doing it and kind of perfecting it later on and seeing how it how it kind of like transforms later on I'm probably very biased in the sense that I would actually put design on equal an equal platform to the science and what we do. And I think that to me, if you only have that one chance, when you put your product in somebody's hand, it's that one opportunity to make an impact. And that to me is something that I wanted to nail down. So for us, I think just overall, you know, if, if this is something that you don't want to place too much importance on, I think that's totally fair. Design is something that you can always refine over time. And I would say that's the same for any, any sort of vertical within the company as well. You don't have to get it perfect the first time. And I would say that that's also the beauty of being a startup, of being an entrepreneur. You get to know your audience over time and they can really help to inform you on what they like, what they don't like and you tweak it as you go. And I would actually say that's the beauty of social media. Our community is very, very outspoken. They'll let us know if there are certain ingredients that they don't like, if there are certain aspects of the brand that they don't align with, then it's always good to hear them out. But I think as a founder, as an entrepreneur, you have to be crystal clear on what your intention is and build from there. So I would say design Yes, it can be second, it's sort of like sort of on the back seat. But, you know, for me, I would actually argue that it is important because you have the ability to capture someone's imagination and attention right off the bat. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I feel like first impressions matter the most, right? Um, and as soon as you see, I feel like as soon as, as a customer sees a product that is like very beautiful or aesthetically pleasing, like they're more inclined to buy it, right? right. Because it's like, oh, um, this looks interesting. Like I want to try it out. Um, and I feel like a lot of the times we tend to relate to the founder or the product a lot more when we're able to kind of see ourselves being more physically attracted to it or emotionally attracted to it, right? And I feel like your product and your packaging just like gives out the, those emotions exactly. And um, yeah, I, I just I just love it so much. I can definitely tell the love and the effort that you put into it. Yes, I think the biggest compliment that I've received so far, someone had mentioned oh, you guys are like the ESOP of the, the supplement category. And that to me was like the, the gold stamp of approval. So I think even on that front, also getting recognition from the design world and just you know how we've created our products, how we've curated it, that's just been so meaningful to me just because that's the community that I see myself in and um, just to be embraced by them has been so meaningful. Yeah, that's amazing. So you have a couple of different products. You have gummies that give you energy, that gummies that help you sleep, gummies that, you know, make you calm or give you focus. Um, a lot of these, you know, obviously you would need to consult with, you know, a medical expert. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, but I know that you mentioned to me previously that you did not have any medical experience or medical background in the past. Yeah. And I, I think that is so amazing because I feel like for a lot of entrepreneurs, when they start a business, they get so caught up in thinking like, I have to be an expert in XYZ in order to sell a product in XYZ, right? right. 
And that's, I feel like that's a really big misconception. Um, you might need to know like the fundamentals of it, but you don't actually need to be an expert in it because you can hire people. What was that process like for you? Um, and how did you, you know, find the right people, the right medical experts to be on your team to help you come out with the right product? Right. So when it comes to science, I understood right off the bat that we needed real experts on board to guide us. And that led to the formation of our wellness council. And as you mentioned, I have no medical background, nor do I have any friends who were doctors in that space that I could use as a sounding board for this idea. So I actually came across our chief medical advisor, Dr. Bowen Jang on Instagram. Uh, Dr. Jang is a fellowship trained neurosurgeon and a spine surgeon at St. Jude. And he did his undergrad and med school at Stanford. And then he completed his neurosurgery residency at uh, Johns Hopkins. So I DM'd him on LinkedIn and thankfully he was down to jump on a call and hear our pitch. And then shortly after that, I found our second wellness advisor, Dr. Tavi Choi on YouTube. Uh, he gave this talk that, a TED talk about the parts of our brain that hold human consciousness. And I found that to just be fascinating. So uh, Dr. Choi is a professor at Stanford University and he's a neuropsychiatrist. So I just went on their website, did a cold email and thankfully he was open to taking a call as well. And then last but not least, I was a huge fan of our third wellness advisor, Nawal, who's also known as the brain coach on Instagram. And she's a PhD candidate in neuropsychology. So when I discovered her Instagram profile, she had around 200,000 followers. She recently surpassed a million and it was just incredible to see her achieve that milestone. But I was drawn to Nawal's content because it was relevant to the topics that I myself was exploring in therapy for the first time. And so I decided to shoot my shot, reach out, and as luck would have it, she was also open to just taking a call with me. And I would say that Nawal has been instrumental in teaching me how to build our community on social, but she's also the reason why we're able to confidently share things like uh, grounding exercises for a panic attack or breathing techniques that are proven to reduce anxiety. And these are things that I do daily. And I mean, just even taking a moment, right? Like I, I love doing this. And Maggie, if you would just uh, humor me in doing this as well, you know, it's two breaths in through the nose. The second breath is uh, shorter than the first and then an exhale through the mouth. So it goes. I've heard of that before. And that is what you call the physiological side. So doc Dr. Andrew Huberman has a really great explanation for this on his podcast, Huberman Lab. And TLDR, this technique just allows for a greater intake for oxygen and the offload of carbon dioxide. So I feel like anybody who works around me just always hears this every hour. It's just me breathing. I'm not crying. But I think, you know, every single person that signed on with us on our wellness council was just super hands on from every stage of from formulation to content development and helping to rally their communities around us when we launched as well. And ultimately, each of them signed on because they understood the importance of us reaching a younger crowd to begin spreading the word about brain health and about mental health. Because in reality, neuro, uh, you know, neuro disorders like Alzheimer's, for example, these are fully preventable and they're lifestyle changes that we can make to really prevent this or just at least delay this from happening. So we as a team, we all fundamentally believe that your brain health and your mental health are things that you should tend to daily in the same way that you take care of your teeth. And you can be eating the healthiest diet, you can be exercising very regularly, but if your connection to yourself is broken, we can truly manifest physical ailments and illnesses in the body. And that's what we wanna shine a spotlight on. So that's why with all of our messaging, we make it very, very clear that it's about the routine. It's not just the product. Just because you're taking calm, it doesn't mean you're going to be calm for the rest of your life. It's more so what are the other habits that you're building to foster a sense of calm in your life? So the gummy should really only be a small component that supports you in that journey. 
Yeah, I think you put it together very beautifully. And um, this, I feel like this goes for a lot of things, right? And I feel like when a lot of people think about, I'm doing this every single day, like, why am I not seeing the results, right? But you really have to think about what are the external things that you're doing to actually get to those goals, right? And when you talk about brain health, mental health, I think a lot of us don't really think about that on a day-to-day basis because we're just always thinking about working, working hard every single day, putting our heads down. Mm -hmm. But honestly, like when we take a step back and we reflect and really realize and, and think about like, how can we work even better rather than working harder? Um, it helps us kind of just reflect and think about, you know, what are the, some of the things that I can do to make this a better routine for myself, right? Because totally. we get so burnt out all the time um, that we don't really think about the things that we can do to set ourselves up for success, um, the things that we can do to make our routine a little bit better. And I feel like it's so important for us to think about those things because we're just going to get so burnt out, Um, especially in the Asian community when our parents always tell us like, you know, you have to work hard, you have to put your head down. But in actuality, like we we can only do as much as we can allow ourselves to do, right? Um, And it's really important for us to think about mental health in our parents' generation. They didn't really think about all of that stuff because there was not enough research about it. Um, And it's not their fault. You know, there was not a lot of people talking about mental health. There was not a lot of people talking about therapy. But especially after the pandemic, I feel like a lot of people have been talking more about therapy, talking about how Mm -hmm. mental health is such an important factor in our lives, just as physical health is. Um, And now we're really, really starting to look more into mental health therapy and everything like that. Um, And my question is, being an AAPI-founded company, I know you're doing a lot of work to help destigmatize mental health within our AAPI community too. So I'd love to kind of like learn, you know, what what were some of the things that you did to kind of help destigmatize mental health in our AAPI community? Totally. I, I think the first thing is also wanting to highlight the importance of representation, because during the brand ideation phase, there were several well-intentioned advisors that really warned us against positioning ourselves as Asian founded, because with the racialization of COVID, there was just concern over, you know, xenophobia or bigotry towards AAPI communities affecting our business in a negative way. And ironically, I think these discussions only strengthened our team's stance in doubling down and wanting to represent our heritage and where we come from. I think it was super important that we supported each other in not allowing that fear to take us, you know, hold us back in any way, shape or form from taking up space. And for us, it shows up in several ways. So in Chinese culture, the number eight, as we all probably know, it symbolizes harmony, it symbolizes balance. And that's because no matter which way you slice the eight, whether it's horizontal or vertical, it's symmetrical. And that for us, we we believed fully that that was a way to showcase our belief in the mind and body connection and bringing harmony to both the body and mind. And not just that, in addition to honoring our team's Asian heritage with our name, Uh, We also chose to highlight our gummy flavors, uh, you know, the Southeast Asian flavors that we grew up eating in Singapore. And that to me was something that I was very proud of, especially when people were saying, you know, just do a berry blast, just do a strawberry lemonade, things that people would easily identify. And, you know, that to us was just not compelling enough. We just felt like that would lose its appeal. And we wanted to just be able to make a statement through our products. So when it comes to actually even like the mental health component, a lot of what we do is activations online. So a lot of what we challenge through our content is how are you speaking to yourself? How are you spending your time? What content are you choosing to actually um, consume? What thoughts are you choosing to ruminate on? Because all of this affects how you show up and how you function. And so even from that standpoint, I think when it comes to the AAPI community, understanding that your parents may not fully get where you're at, and that's okay, what you can actually make sure to just keep in check is yourself. How are you feeling? Making sure that you're showing up in your best light in the way that you want to, in a way that's genuine to you. And I think that's the most that we can do. And making sure that, of course, if our parents are open to hearing us out and hearing our journey, that's beautiful, but sometimes that's not always the case. And you don't have to beat yourself up over that. You don't have to feel negatively about that. Just know that the things that you can change are within your control. Anything outside of that 
let it go. It's okay. And I think that's the biggest thing that even I'm still coming to terms with as an adult. You know, there's sometimes I get so worked up over certain aspects, certain topics that I'm just like, I wish people would understand. I wish they would just get it right because it would make things so much easier. But that's life. It doesn't always happen that way. And we have to just learn that it's okay. It's okay to sometimes even not feel okay, right? And to sit through the, the discomfort, sit through the pain and knowing that, you know, it's teaching me something. I'm going to look back maybe a year from now, and this is going to be a huge stepping stone for me and where I'm at today. And that's how I choose to look at just my overall mental health journey. I think I'm always going to be a work in progress. There's never an end goal. There's never an end state. It's always just going to be me chipping away at this, learning as I go, making mistakes as I go and forgiving myself for those mistakes. And I think leading by example, opening up these conversations within our community to know that it's okay to talk about your feelings. It's not how we were raised, but that's cool. Uh, you know, and just being able to articulate ourselves in that way, even if you're not ready to talk, you don't want to participate in those conversations. I think even just showing up and listening is very powerful because it helps you think about, you know, ruminate on like, do I agree with this? Is this how I also want to sort of change my course? Do I want to consider this? And that is very impactful. So even though you're not ready yet to participate in these conversations, seek out therapy, that may not even be an option from a financial standpoint, right? I think it's also choosing to just really focus on what you can control. Am I following the right people on social? How am I feeling when I get off my phone? Am I actually getting outside each day to get some sunlight in? Am I nourishing my body enough? You know, how am I checking in with myself? I think we are always so caught up with just the fast pace of how this world is. It's sometimes very easy to forget about you. And that's something that I think we all just have to protect for our own sake, right? Just being able to actually show ourselves some kindness and show ourselves some love in the same way that we would show our, our family some our, our love and our support. So it's really going back to how are you we evaluating what we can control in our lives and how do we make the best out of what we have? Yeah, I love that. And when you said it's okay to not be okay, that's absolutely true. And I think why it's so hard for us to kind of see that in the Asian community is because there's such a big, you know, thing about saving face, right? Yeah. Like our parents always want to save face. And, you know, anytime something bad happens to us, we never, our parents never want us to expose it or tell other people about it. But, you know, there are things that we can't control and that's okay, like you mentioned, right? And the only thing that we can control is our thoughts, our emotions, our reactions towards the things that happen to us, right? And there are always going to be things that happen to us, uh, whether they be good or bad, but it doesn't mean that we have to have a negative reaction to those things that happen to us. Um, so you, you kind of, you know, put the nail on the head, like there are things that we can control and the things that we can't, but the things that we can is our reaction and our emotions towards those things that happen to us. Absolutely. Yeah. And one thing to add to that too, it's, you don't have to fully entertain every thought that comes right. to your mind, right? Especially if it's negative. I feel like that's something I'm still working on and I have learned through therapy. Like, hey, if I'm thinking about something, I'm giving it life. And just even being able to change course and think, hey, this is just a thought. What evidence do I have to support this thought? More oftentimes than not, it's just based on nothing, it's based out of fear. Right. And so even learning how to challenge that has been pretty liberating and understanding like, oh, I don't have to believe everything that comes to mind. And, you know, that is the whole power of that's the power of our brain of neuroplasticity. We have the ability to actually change how we think, change how we behave. And that is actually, of course, easier said than done. And oftentimes very, very painful to actually just put into motion as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. And sometimes I say no response is a response, right? Yes. Sometimes you don't have to entertain those thoughts, those emotions that come your way. Um, but having no response is actually sometimes the best response yes. um, because you don't have to pay any attention to it. Um, but yeah, you, you bring up a really good point. So I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, when you had first started with this brand number eight, um, kind of talking a little bit about like competition as well. You know, at that time, I'm sure in the market, there were a lot of other gummy brands out there um, that were probably doing something similar, right? 
Did you have any pushback from others, um, especially being a woman, a API founder, a person of color, um, starting a business in gummies that many people might have thought like there's so many other gummy brands out there, like how are you going to compete against them? What was your approach to this? And I mean, as I can see now, you've definitely made your brand stand out among all these other gummy brands. But right. I want to know, like, what was going through your mind? What was your your kind of thought process going into this market? And how were you able to kind of achieve, you know, that competitiveness against other brands? Right. So I feel like just even taking a step back, not even with gummies, right? I think I shared with you, I attended my first trade show this year. And I was very deliberate. I mapped out every single booth of my favorite brands. And I'll never forget walking up to my former favorite tea brand I had long supported and had just outright assumed was Asian owned because their assortment featured, you know, ceremonial matcha, turmeric, pur. And I was so disheartened as I was speaking to their president to know that he had zero knowledge of the cultural significance between, you know, in their ingredients, nor did he have a single person of color working the booth. And this happened several times over with other brands that were selling Asian sauces and curry mixes. And I believe that if your brand is built off the backs of other cultures and or identities that doesn't belong to you, it's crucial that you're able to reference and pay homage to the origins and the cultural significance of your products. So that was first and foremost how I understood that's how I'm going to differentiate number eight from any gummy brand that's out there. I want to tell a story and not just that. I want to tell a comprehensive story around brain health and how that correlates to mental health. So that, again, was drawing on my experience from Museum of Ice Cream. Every single room had a narrative. Every single product that was in a room was very deliberate. And that's how I approached us going into this overly saturated category that everybody, I would say across the board was like, don't do it, don't do it. Every every single stage of our company, there was always a naysayer, but there was just so much conviction over, I can do this differently. We can deliver this in a way that hasn't been done before. And I would even say one of my biggest inf inspiration points too was NeuroGum. Um, it was started by two Asian men, uh, Ryan and Ken. And I just watched, I remember watching their Shark Tank episode and just being like incredibly amazed with how far they've come. And, you know, just knowing that other people have done it and they, they've done it well, and there's room enough for more people to join in. And I knew that my differentiating point was not just the product, but social. So even though if our gummies aren't for you, hopefully there's something useful that you can find on our blogs, on our website, on our social media channels that can really help inform you and guide conversations around just overall mental health. Yeah. And thank you so much for sharing that story. And I'm so sorry that that happened. And I, I'm, it must have been so disheartening, you know, and I feel like a lot of it is happening because there's a rise in Asian flavors right now, like the rise in popularity of Asian flavors. I mean, I feel like a lot of companies, especially companies that are not Asian led or Asian owned, they're pretty much just kind of riding on this wave, right? right. They see that Asian flavors are getting really popular. So you might as well hop on it. But you're right. Like a lot of them don't have Asian executives or Asian founders. And that is really disheartening. And it, it, you're absolutely right that there is more space for us to, to really, you know, tackle and really like, you know, claim space for ourselves to get into, um, you know, the food and beverage industry, really making sure that there are Asians or AAPIs that are on the team to, you know, pay homage and really, you know, educate people on what these right. flavors should be like. Um, I'm glad to know and glad to see that, you know, there are people in our community that are um, doing this, especially like the Nero founders, like we've connected yes. with them as well. Um, it's just amazing what you guys are doing. Totally. And I think there, again, there's space for everybody to tell their stories. Right. And I think at every single stage, it's, it's not just, uh, you know, particularly with wellness, I would say, I would actually even argue that it happens in the fashion industry. It happens in the tech industry. There's just so much that we're up against. And that's why it's 
it equally, if not more important, that we're able to be a, a lot louder and not as reserved and actually claim our stake in this because it actually helps to open up more doors for generations that are going to come, generations that will follow us. So it is making a difference whether you recognize it or not. Yeah, absolutely. So I do want to shift the conversation a little bit to you, Trina, and ask how you manage your mental health, because being an entrepreneur, being a small business owner, um, it has its ups and downs. And it's really, really hard. You know, you're yeah. literally working 24 um, seven. And it can be really tiring sometimes. And there's you know, being a business owner, there's fires every single day. Oh, yeah. Um, so I want to know, like, how you personally manage your mental health on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I think there's just certain non-negotiables for me. Like, my time to sleep is my time to sleep, and no one's going to interrupt that. Um, so that's number one. I would say even, like, my, my water intake, I always have, like, a huge jug next to me, and that's non-negotiable either. I feel like that's something that I've built up over time throughout the pandemic. And separately, I, I, this is something that we have in common, Maggie, strength training, weightlifting. I feel like that time for me is so important. I've seen such great great changes, not just in my body, but in my mental state. And I think as someone who is somewhat of like a type A, just being able to also notice like, oh, I'm, I'm lifting heavier weights. I feel stronger. I feel more in tune with my body. That's very, very empowering. And I see that impact in how I show up, how I present myself. It gives me so much more confidence. So I feel like those three are things that I'm very, very clear on. And aside from, of course, I sketch daily, I journal daily. Those are things that I do before bed that help me unwind and get off of my phone entirely. So those are practices that are very near and dear to my heart. It's something that I do regardless if I'm working, you know, if I'm taking time off. Those are things that I do to nourish myself. And those are things that I also encourage other people to do. It doesn't cost any money. It doesn't actually cost too much, uh, you know, of your time either. It's just being disciplined in that because the benefit that you see, the halo effect that you see from that, it's truly a beautiful ripple effect into every aspect of your life. Oh yeah, definitely. I love it. And strength training. Yes. I remember when to all the listeners, Trina and I met for coffee a couple of weeks ago, and that's what we connected on. We realized that we both love strength training. Yes. Um, and you're absolutely right. Like it's one of those things where it's like, it's my non-negotiable. Like I have to do it because I know that I'm just better off doing it. Right. Um, and it's those things that like, if you don't do it on one day, like you might not feel the effects of it, but if it like adds up and you don't do it for like two days or three days or a week, you really start to feel like, oh, like what's missing in my life, yeah. you know? And it's really important for us to kind of set those habits for ourselves, J journaling, writing, reading, um, you know, going to the gym, whatever makes you personally happy. Um, and will kind of like lift the pressure off your shoulders, right? Because we're for just- sure constantly every single day we're told like we have to work harder um work more work every single day it it gets it's weight it weighs down on us right and we have to totally. figure out like what are those things that really lift us up and really are good for our mental health totally yeah and Maggie what about you aside from like strength training just curious like is there anything that you do aside from that that you're like you know this is something that nourishes my soul nourishes my body and that's a non-negotiable for me Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, number one, strength training, weightlifting is like my number one thing. Like I have to do that. Um, otherwise, I start feeling really down on myself, right? Not only because um, it's not only like a physical thing, but I just feel like weak, like mentally and physically yes. weak. Um, and it makes me feel like I'm not doing enough for my body. And that plays a long way into how we work as well. When we're not treating our bodies right, um, we end up not doing well in our work and our career, right? Because it's just weighs down on us mentally. Um, sure. Other things is like, yeah, journaling. Journaling is like really, really healthy. It helps us release all of our thoughts onto paper. Yes. And I tend to like, like actually writing it out in my journal um, rather than typing it out. Cause I feel like there's just, you know, it's more personable that way. Um, yeah. I can really like sense my emotions when I'm writing it out. Um, and then some other things is just like taking a walk, like 
before I didn't get a chance to do that because I was living in a pretty uh, sketchy area but now I'm like able to walk around my neighborhood and just like saying hi to neighbors and stuff is like something that I never got to do before but it actually helps me feel a lot more refreshed at the end of the day when I'm like just able to take a walk in my neighborhood so yeah totally and those are the things that you know truly help to foster a sense of calm a sense of happiness because you're giving yourself a moment to connect with yourself to check in with you. And that's, you know, even on the journaling front, I always get so many questions like, how do I even journal? Like, what do you even write? Like, how do you write? And it's really anything that comes to mind. You can just even, you know, as a starting point, maybe even writing down some affirmations for yourself. Like, what are things that you want to bring into your life that are good? You know, what are things that you're struggling with? Maybe it's bullet points, a list of just like, you know, your thoughts. What do you want to do that week? What do you want to achieve? There's not really a right or a wrong way to do it. It's just purely, as you said, getting your thoughts down on a piece of paper and, you know, maybe even referencing that maybe a few months down and understanding like, oh, I've grown or maybe there are certain things that I still need to work on and that's cool. At least I'm aware of it too. Oh yeah, definitely. It's amazing just looking back in your journal and being like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I thought that way before. Like, I can't believe I was going through that before and look how far I've come, you know? And without it, you wouldn't be able to kind of look back on those memories and look back on how you thought before. Um, So yeah, journaling really, really helps. Um, So Trina, what's next for you in like the next five years? Where do you see number eight going? So we hope to expand our distribution channels. As I mentioned, our first in real life touch point has been Four Seasons New York and they are incredible partners, but hopefully more properties similar to that, hopefully more um, areas where we can actually encompass like a lifestyle element to it as well. I hope to also just include more products into our assortment, expand our distribution outside of the US and Canada. Um, and just really build up our awareness overall. I think we're at that stage right now. We're eight months into our launch. We're just trying to make sure that people are aware we even exist. And I think it's a very exciting time to be just, you know, a founder in this space, especially with this brand and knowing that we are also making an impact on our community. There have been so many DMs that we receive and I'm the one that's fielding all of our DMs alongside our founding partner, Danica. Um, You know, just seeing that, oh, this post helped me talk to my son about this subject and it helped us, you know, just provide guidelines around our conversation and just knowing that it's one simple Instagram post that's sparking conversations that are meaningful, that are truly life-changing. It's also giving me, you know, encouragement to know that maybe there's other things that we can do. Maybe there's a book in the near future, or maybe there's more podcasts, more keynote speeches that we can give around that topic. But, you know, how do we extend our reach outside of product? And that's something that I'm very, very excited to build and looking forward to that tremendously. I'm looking forward to it as well. And I know for sure that you're going to get there, Trina. Thank you, Maggie. (laughs) So we have one last question for you, Trina. And that is, if you could give one advice to an aspiring entrepreneur, what would that advice be? So the biggest thing is be shameless about promoting yourself, promoting your products. And this is coming from a real introvert, right? I I think you've got to be your own biggest advocate in this space and remind yourself that no one can sell your product better than you can. A lot of our community growth, as I mentioned, was built through our DMs. So I'm on my phone every single day, reaching out to business leaders, people I admire. That's how we got connected, Maggie. And, you know, I, I think people would be surprised to see how willing other people are to connect or just even take a 10 minute call, a 15 minute call. And I would also add to that, don't ever get disheartened if you don't get a response, if people leave you on read. I think people tend to get tripped up over that and then just stop. So, you know, you're not going to be for everybody and that's cool, but you've just got to keep going. You've got to keep it moving, keep one foot in front of the other. As I shared, our entire wellness council was built literally through DMs. And I think that's the power of social media and what it can unlock for us at this day and age. And I think aside from that, you know, separately, one of our taglines is nourish the brain, 
fuel the soul. So again, going back to what we were discussing earlier, as a business owner, how you spend your time is critical. You have to be mindful of where your intention lies. And by that, I mean, again, you know, what, what's the content that you're consuming? What are the types of people that you choose to surround yourself with? Um, what are the thoughts that you're choosing to ruminate on? So these are questions that maybe for some are challenging to explore, but at the end of the day, it's always worth doing the exercise because it's going to help you provide clarity on what your purpose and what your intention is. And also, if you take the time to get to know yourself, I think other people's thoughts and actions that they're most likely projecting become less of a stumbling block. And in that sense, your inner world can truly become infinite. So those are the the main tips that I would give aside from, of course, take care of your mind, take care of your body, but also take time to check in with yourself and get to know who you are as an individual outside of your business. You know, who are you um, as a person? Yeah. Thank you for that advice. I love it so much. And you're absolutely right about, you know, just reaching out to anyone that you want to have a conversation with and that's exactly how we got connected. Trina reached yeah. out to us and um, I loved our first conversation and you're right. Like you wouldn't be, you would be surprised to see like how many people are willing to actually say yes, to get a cup of coffee, coffee with you. Right. And I, some pe some people may not respond and it could be because they're busy because right. I don't know some other reason, but it doesn't matter what that reason is. There's so many other people who would be willing to say yes to, you know, get coffee with you to, you know, totally. teach you something, to learn something from you. Um, and just wanted to thank you for that advice because it's it's really, really good. Of course, of course. So Trino, where can our listeners find out more about you and number eight online? And do you have any last words to share? So you can learn more about number eight by visiting eight.health or checking us out on social media platforms at weareno.8. Um, and most importantly, as we approach National Suicide Prevention Month in September, I wanted to close by sharing that if you or anyone you know is struggling with your mental health, any thoughts of suicide or substance abuse, you can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Hotline, which is 988 here in the US. And you can learn more about that hotline at 988lifeline.org. Thank you so much for sharing that, Trina. And we will leave all of that in the show notes of this episode. It was amazing having you on our podcast today. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for sharing your story with us, Trina. You're the best. <laughs> Thank you. You too.